Cashed it with Sunday's complimentary play as the Oakland A's got the job done and completed a three-game road sweep of the Chicago White Sox. And I'll get to your Monday complimentary play in just a moment. But listen, it's 3.40 in the morning. I'm wide awake, as you can tell. So let's have a little more fun about this day in history. And oh, I've got some good ones for you today, guys. Let's start in the music world because on this day in 1977, Elvis Presley made his last live stand appearance at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis. And here's a couple of bits of irony for you. Also born on this day in 1910, Colonel Tom Parker, who probably did more to destroy Elvis's career than Elvis himself. And the final bit of irony is that Elvis's dad, Vernon Presley, passed away at the age of 63 in 1979, just two short years after his son passed away and following Elvis's final stage appearance. So what a strange bit of coincidence there, all falling on this day in history. Uh, also, born on this day, Patti Smythe of Scandal. Now listen, guys, I love Patti Smythe. I mean, I truly love Patti Smythe. My wife's asleep, so it's okay, and she knows I love Patti Smythe as well. If you happen to be in the Philadelphia area back in the early 80s and you watched the Phillies on WPHL Channel 17 at the time, there was a television commercial for Frank's Soda where there was this girl in the studio singing this great song about Frank's Soda with this husky voice. And she's, you know, the camera is just swirling around her. And it was Patti Smythe. And I didn't know who this girl was, but I was in love with this girl. She had this rough edge to her and she was hot. Well, like 1980s hot at the time, dangling earrings and just she was hot. And I always thought, who is this girl? I just loved her voice. Well, that girl turned out to be Patti Smythe of Scandal. Scandal, of course, came out with a mini EP a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years later, Goodbye to You was the hit single. Paul Schaefer of David Letterman band fame was playing piano. John Bon Jovi at one point was playing guitar uh, for the studio version of that album, I think, on a couple of cuts. Uh, had some fame. Most of you probably know Patti Smythe, the Scandal, for that unfortunate big hit single they had, The Warrior. That was the worst song that they ever did. Tremendous vocalist, had that husky voice. Of course, now, later years, married to John McEnroe for like 18, 19 years. But just a tremendous singer, tremendous vocalist. Of course, listen, I mean, you know, Eddie Van Halen, when he gave the axe to uh, David Lee Roth, wanted Patty to come and join Van Halen, become lead vocalist. Unfortunately, she was eight months pregnant, didn't want to go into that lifestyle. Uh, as she said, I think one time, you know, the guys were always drunk. She was eight months pregnant. She wasn't about to go tour with the band at the time. Um, but to give an example of what a great vocalist she is, if you uh, have never been familiar with her music, uh, go on YouTube, uh, punch in Patty Smythe, not Patty Smith, Patty Smythe, and you go in and you check out that's Patty Smythe, S M Y T H, and punch in Patty Smythe, David Letterman, and watch her from her mid 80 appearances because Letterman loved her, and watch her do her renditions of Whole Lot of Love or Janis Joplin's uh, Piece of My Heart, and I mean, just tremendous. But anyway, still my favorite. So my son, of course, loved her too. My son's a huge music fan, and of course, hey, he's got my whole music collection and his own, which is even more extensive than mine. But many years ago, I, well, I want to say probably about, uh, it's been probably about 10 years ago, um, she goes out on a solo tour and we happened to be in Vegas at the time visiting and she's at the South Point. So I figured, hey, we'll go over and see her at the South Point. I swear to God, I counted everybody in the South Point showroom. Probably the showroom holds about 450 people. I, there were 33 people, including uh, us as guests and the people that was the bar and the wait staff. 33 people in the place. Patty Smythe just, I mean, she put on a show as if she was playing for 15,000. I mean, just incredible. Of course, my son, who's maybe 11 years old, 12 years old at the time, by far the youngest in the audience by maybe 30 years. Um, 
she just played up to him like you wouldn't believe. I, I couldn't tell if he was blushing or not, you know, but, but it was just it was just an amazing performance who by a singer who I, as I said, played as if she was playing in front of, you know, Wembley Stadium that day. But uh, anyway, one of my favorites. But let's get to the best part about this day in history. In 1963, there were these two guys, Lennon and McCartney. They began composing this song called She Loves You after a concert uh, at the Majestic Ballroom in uh, Newcastle, England, where they were touring with uh, Roy Arverson and uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers. They started riding it on the tour bus. They worked on it later that night in their hotel room, and then they finished the song the very next day at uh, McCartney's uh, family home in Liverpool. Now, this was June 26th. They finished the song the very next day, June 27th. They recorded the song July 1st at EMI Studios in London. They released it August 23rd in the UK and September 16th in the U.S., it was a monster, monster hit in the UK. It was a total bomb in the US. Yeah, absolute total bomb in the US. Sold less than 100,000 copies and didn't even chart. And here's the irony of all ironies. This was the first time the songwriting credit was flipped. Up to that point, it was always McCartney and Lennon. This is the first time it became Lennon and McCartney. And you know the problems that caused down the road in later years for those two, right? But anyway, Bond in the U.S. only sold around 1,000 copies, right? Never charted on Billboard. Hell, on American Bandstand, they had that feature. Well, listen, not that I was around then, but they had that feature on American Bandstand they called Rate a Record. It scored in the low 70s. But and there was a feature on the CBS Morning News that they ran uh, back on November 22nd of that year about Beatlemania taking a hold of the United Kingdom. And it featured heavily, She Loves You. And uh, it was scheduled to rerun later that night. But it never did because that was the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But a month later, on December 10th, Walter Cronkite of CBS News repeated that five-minute feature and She Loves You was the prominent song played throughout that feature. And that led the Beatles management to um, release I Want to Hold Your Hand in January before the Beatles' imminent arrival to the United States. And consequently, She Loves You finally charted January 25th of 1965. And it finished the year number two. On the U.S. charts, right behind I Want to Hold Your Hand. And She Loves You actually was on the charts for 15 weeks. And that was a time at one point in 1964 where the Beatles had five hits in the top five. And I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You constantly was going back and forth between number one and number two on the charts. Fast forward to June 26, 1964. Now, this is a year after they wrote the song, right? June 26, 1964, A Hard Day's Night. That album was released in the USA two weeks prior to its release in the United Kingdom. Think about it. Nowadays, you have artists who, if you're lucky, they release an album, you know what, every two years. Unless you're a country artist and you release an album every six weeks. Unless you're Rihanna and you're releasing an album every six and a half hours. You know, nowadays, artists just take their time. Not the Beatles. They were just constantly churning out the music. But... That's how it goes. And you know the, uh, hate to steal this from Paul Harvey, but you know the rest of the story. Okay, let's get to your complimentary play. I'm going to go with the Washington Nationals, minus $1.45 tonight uh, against the um, Chicago Cubs. Uh, Gio Gonzalez, the Nationals are 4-1 and one in his last five starts, has a 1.66 earned run average and seven home starts. That's the good news. Now, the reason I am not playing the Nationals at the huge take that back price of $1.45 on the run line is this. The Nationals are just 2-5 and five in his home starts this season. They have only scored 13 runs in his five losses. He is just one of those pitchers who, despite how well he pitches doesn't get a lot of offensive support. It's amazing to me over the years, and there's no rhyme or reason for this, how guys who pitch so well sometimes get no offensive support, and guys who have these absurd ERAs 
get all the runs in the world and don't do anything with it. But the bottom line is, in the 43 and a third innings pitched at home this season, Gonzalez has only allowed 31 hits. Has he pitched that well during his career against the Cubs? Not necessarily, as his earned run average is 3.93 in nine career starts, and it was six in two starts a year ago. But the Cubs have not been playing well on the road, as we know. Cubs have not been hitting effectively all season long. And Eddie Butler, their starter today, has a 5.63 earned run average in three previous road starts this year. So, not on the run line, but... Definitely on the money line, I'll go with Washington minus the dollar forty-five in this spot. The Nationals will be your free play for today's card. Washington, the way to go. Good luck, everybody. I'll talk to you again tomorrow when we do this one more time.